Does that sound alright for everyone? Sounds good to me. Okay. Super. Right, well, you can face off start. <laughs> Hi, I'm Camilla Voyez. I'm here today with Vanessa Knight, uh, Scott Gruber and Paul Grover. We're all chatting about our writing processes and um, hopefully we'll find something useful out of it for each other and maybe you will too. Okay, so I started off as a writer as a complete pantster. Um, a lot of my novels, my early novels, were written during NaNoWriMo. The only thing I cared about was making sure that I was writing a certain number of words each day. And then I left my staff with the job of tidying it up at the end, which it worked, but it probably wasn't the best way to write things. And it did mean I got myself tangled up quite a few times into some knots that were difficult to untie. So I have started planning a lot more than I used to. I guess I'm somewhere in the middle there. Now, I think they call it a planster. So I'm gonna call myself that. <laughs> um, so what I'm doing first of all, is I'm looking for ideas. Now quite often ideas will just kind of fly up. Maybe I'll have a question about life that I want to answer and I'll start writing from that point. Um, I'll talk about my ideas for a few of the novels, but you can get them from anywhere. I mean, scientific journals or books that you've read or folk tales. Um, it's, it, no, they are everywhere that you look. So for the ballerine and the revolutionary, my initial idea is very little like the Finnish novel. Um, I started with the mother of the person that the protagonist I called Crow and it was very much about this schizophrenic woman who felt that she spoke to ghosts and saw ghosts and fell in love with a much younger man. Uh, with Starblood, it actually started with a scene with Lilith. Uh, I imagined a woman who was so strong, so powerful, um, that she could com completely humiliate the stalker that was following her. So that's where that one started. And with Venus Virus, it was um, an idea about how it would look if women took over rather than men. So we ended up with the matriarchy. And my other one, it, what I'm writing right now, um, the, secret of, the Secret Lives of Melissa Powell or Witch of Witchwood, or probably something completely different, um, basically started with how would hierarchy look in an all-female space? And could you be in prison yet still be free? So that's kind of so a little bit more airy-fairy, I suppose, the way I started with that one. But it was an idea, and that was all I was after at the time. So then I'll write a scene and use as many of the characters that, I've, uh, that I want to as I can. And then after that scene, which usually gets discarded, apart from with Starblood, which it became chapter two, um, after that, then I'm looking into any research I need to do. Uh, with a lot of them, I had to research quite thoroughly. Starblood, it was very much about all the magic that I was using in there. I wanted to make sure that it was sort of uh, magic that potentially could be real. Um, with Melissa Powell, it's very much about women's prisons. Uh, with Venus Virus, it was about hormonal changes and um, how to sort of create viruses and um, which was my other one? Oh, Ballerina Revolutionary, Shamanism and Dream Symbolism. So those, that was what I was researching. And then I'd start like I used to do, but with a lot more work already gone into it. And I'd try and write a first draft. Now, quite often I wouldn't get all the way through to the ending because I'd get stuck somewhere really really tangly and what I've done most recently with that is I've stopped I've looked at what I've got so far with uh, Melissa Powell it was 60,000 words and I felt I was at halfway but I didn't know where to go from there so I went back over it all I ended up cutting about 20,000 words and restructured it completely. Originally I had um, a prison guard story and then Melissa Powell's story, but I actually intermingled them so that they were running concurrently um, with alternate chapters. And that really freed me up, just looking at it from a different angle and getting rid of an awful lot of the repetition had accidentally found its way in there. Um, so after I've done that, I can then hopefully I haven't finished yet, but hopefully go on and finish the, the first draft. 
Um, what I'm looking for at this stage is to get so ingrained and so entangled in my characters' lives that I start thinking about them when I'm not writing. So I always have a notepad. I have it next to my bed with a torch. I have it when I'm going out for walks. If anything comes to me, even you know, if it isn't used later, it gets written down. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for like developing their stories. Um, so once, once I've done all that, um, I do try and leave it for at least a month after the first draft is written. Uh, if I've got another project on the go, I'll go and finish that one to the end of the first draft before coming back. So it can be months, but I like to try and leave it for at least one month. And then I look through again, I read it, start to finish making notes so that I know what the timeline's like to make sure I haven't really messed up with that. Because I did with Starbird big time. <laughs> and my uh, editors at the time had to, you know, send me a completely different direction on some places. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm quite aware of that now. And continuity. And then once I've done that, I'll go through again and I'll look at the language to make sure that there is a rhythm to it, that I'm trying to end on quite strong words where possible, unless it stops making sense at that point. And that I'm um, basically making the language as beautiful as possible at this stage. Then I go through again and proofread it, looking for errors and looking for repetitions. After that, I send it to Vanessa. And she usually finds, oh, she's been my editor for the last decade and she's brilliant. I don't know how much time she has, but she's absolutely fabulous. Um, so she normally finds a hell of a lot that I've missed. And then I'm going back over it again and looking all the way through. Most of her suggestions I agree with, quite a few of them are quite open. Um, so it's like, well, this doesn't work, but you know, you can maybe do something with it. Um, and then after that, it's a final proofread before it goes off to whoever it's going off to. Um, and that is my process. So I've got here, I don't know if it's of any interest, but I've got a little A4 file, the Witch of Witchwood um, prison. And I've got all the sorts, well, they don't go that far in, but all the sorts of notes, diagrams of what the prison and the different settings look like, character notes, um, where I want it to go, how I think I'll get there. So that's all in there, including the timeline for the first half, because when I was cutting, I was already doing that part. Um, and then I thought I'd just show a few of the novels that I produced, Ballerine and the Revolutionary. Venus Virus and this is a Starblood trilogy although it's also available in individual books. Now I'm going to ask my uh, colleagues, my colleagues, my friends, my other group members if they've got any questions about my process and before I hand off to Scott. Any questions? No? Scott go ahead. Look forward to hearing yours. All right. Uh, well typically you know, if we, when we start with ideas, the vast majority of my ideas come from my dreams. Uh, like Dance of the Butterfly, for instance. It wasn't entirely dream, dreamt, but it did begin as a dream that I wanted to somehow incorporate into a story. As you might guess, it's not like I dream the whole novel. I dream what I consider to be like a good basis, a good beginning, a good setting, something like that. And then what I'll do is I'll go put together sort of like a treatment. Uh, something that's a little more detailed than just jotting some notes. I mean, you guys know what a treatment is. Um, I have a lot of those just waiting for me to put more focus on them and find the time to write them out. So I guess I've, I'm pretty fortunate in that regard that I do get a lot of my ideas from dreams. Um, now what that means though is that sometimes I have in my mind, like I did just recently, I finally finished the Butterfly Trilogy this was the next thing, X was the next thing I was gonna work on, but no, a dream popped in, because I don't know when to expect those, and it was the one that you guys have read some of, and that was the first time I had a dream that was nearly the whole thing. It blew, my, when I woke up from that, I, it blew my mind. I quickly wrote down, I think like an eight page treatment, just to kind of, so I wouldn't forget it. Uh, so I'm working on that, and the thing I was gonna work on is getting pushed off again. Um, but I still have to fill in the blanks and that's where I really have the challenge 
because I, I'm so used to the dreams giving me the ideas, sometimes when I have to sort of pick them out of thin air, if you will, I have a little more difficulty with that. It takes a lot of massaging. I try to sort of just put myself in it, like almost like as if I'm watching a movie and let it just happen. I'll tell people some of the ideas and get some feedback and then just try to connect those dots. Um, but I have used other ideas. Uh, for instance, I did write a novel, never tried to get it published, but it started out with me thinking that I wanted to write a novel where there was some representation either via character or concept of all of the major arcana cards of the tarot. So I wrote that out. I don't know, I don't even remember why that came to me. It just did, and so I wrote this story, and it was sort of a science fiction story. Um, and then I had another novel where I was looking at the back of an album, and the way the songs were listed, they were sort of grouped, because it was a, um, a theme album. I just thought, that looks like a table of contents. And I wrote a novel that had nothing to do uh, with the album. I just, I saw that and I thought, that should be a table of contents. I'm gonna write the novel that goes with that table of contents. So weird stuff like that. Uh, but mainly it's just dreams. But then once I get that down, I can find myself going into the rabbit hole of research very easily. Uh, I will research the weirdest things, which I'm sure none of you ever do. Uh, like I spent a lot of time researching the difference between the way windows open in the United States versus Europe. Uh, because they do open differently, if you guys didn't know that, uh, maybe you did. Uh, di different things like what the tobacco laws were at the time, because I was writing in a way that I, I wanted it to feel like that place. So just things like that. I've even consulted with a uh, physician on how you would react if you were suddenly shot with a drug, but you had no idea what it was. You know, just things like that. Whenever I'm lucky enough to get be able to talk with someone who's a professional um, so I can really drop into the rabbit hole of research just for something short and that ultimately maybe doesn't contribute that much to the story, but I just love doing that. Um, a lot of my names also come from the dreams. I get a lot of compliments on my names and I just think, uh, the dream just handed it to me. I thank you for the compliment, but boom, there it was. But then other times if I have to come up with the names myself, that's another rabbit hole I can get into where I spend far too much time trying to think of the proper name. But then sometimes, like uh, my main character in the Butterfly series, her name is an Easter egg. So it was deliberately chosen. And most people do not figure it out because you would probably have to have a pretty good command of the Finnish language to get the Easter egg. And outside of Finland, I'm not sure how many people, but anyway, be that as it may. Uh, and then that kind of dovetails into another concept. I love to throw in Easter eggs and little references in the stuff that I write. Some of the references are obvious. Some of them I love just to bury them within depths of obscurity that maybe only two or three people will get. I put in a pretty deep reference uh, to the Zodiac Killer. I don't know if you all are familiar with the Zodiac Killer. He was a serial killer back in the 70s and 80s, I think it was, here in San Francisco. They never caught him. Uh, I put a reference to the Zodiac Killer in my Dance of the Butterfly so that if people picked up on the reference, they would figure out what was going on. But I deliberately did it as a red herring to fool only the people that would get the reference. So just obscure stuff like that, you know. So another rabbit hole. But uh, as far as the way I write, what I'm trying to do is I'm really trying to tell a story and paint a picture. I, I look at it more artistically than technically, if that makes sense. I do keep outlines, I do keep notes, I do keep timelines. But uh, once I get all that down, I just want to just like, let's all sit around a fire and I'm going to just tell you a story. That's sort of the way I feel about it. I don't have any sort of goals like words per day or pages per day. I never do that. My approach is more like, let's spend some time writing. And if I only end up with 100 words, fine. If I end up with 5,000, great. But to me, it's more like structuring it as a job. Uh, spend some time doing it, researching, editing, outlining, whatever it might be. Uh, and then as far as editing, I edit as I go. I'm, I've, I feel like sometimes that's a distraction, but I, I just that's one thing I have trouble with is uh, not editing as I go along. And then when I'm done, 
I do a lot more editing. Editing to me is extremely important. I want to hand a manuscript over to my editor and our publisher that doesn't need very much work. I want to get uh, the 97% of it done if I can when, when I let go of it. And that's pretty much it. Fantastic. Thank you. Vanessa next then. Okay, I'm uh, apparently going to do this a little bit differently. So, um, okay, uh, I'm sure you can put up with me. Um, okay, so I'm going to do screen sharing. Um, can you see the screen? Good. So, here we go. Okay, here we go. So this is one of my favorite quotes in the whole universe. I have this unconscious burglar in my, uh, living in my mind. If I read something, it's mine. So, um, okay, I always start with just this vague idea. It can come from anywhere. It's usually boring, uh, just sort of drifting there and it comes in and then, oh, right. The next stage is where I do all my research. This is where I, my vague idea starts picking up on little bits I, you know, in my dreams or um, an overheard conversation, um, a line from another book or a picture. And anyway, this is where all my research gets done just, just before, you know, the vague idea. And then it all goes into a notebook. So a notebook, um, which is either some physical writing in paper or a file on my computer. That's just fine. So <laughs> that's how it works. So there we go. The notebook then feeds into everything, into, well, it's one or more books. The, the ideas just feed in there. And I always have to have my end line before I start. Because if I don't know where I'm going, how can I get there? I'm not a pantser. I really do need to know what the end line is before I can start writing. And this is where my characters come in. I don't know my characters when I start the book. As, I re, as I'm writing the draft, I learn what their personalities are when I see how they solve problems. And uh, that's the only way I can find out what my characters are. By the end of the first draft, they're pretty much there. The people are there. And then, the sub, then I go through subsequent drafts and the ideas feed in still from the notebook in subsequent drafts. And um, because I may have, you know, I may have a new idea or I may see how an old idea will fit in there. And then after however many drafts it takes, I have a story. <laughs> so how does that fit in? How does that work in practice? So my current working process is um, cli-fi or hope punk, which doesn't mean it's a happy clappy utopia. All, all it means is it's not a Mad Max dystopia. It's just ha people having a civilized society even after uh, 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 the uh, climate change has happened. So my idea is a world after the sea rises. Uh, now we've first seen this world in my book, uh, Last Days Forever, um, though this is not part of my time travel series. Uh, it's just the world is there. So I thought, all right, I'll use it. So first off, I had a dream about them swimming. So I sort of thought, oh, how would they swim? Well, they'd have fins in their hands. So I found something like that. Then there's this wonderful Twitter bot all over Twitter. It's wonderful. And it comes up with these wonderful prompts of what's going on in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a world after the seas risen. And so this is shivering within the cold rain, the ill-tempered seas, seas denies its eels which is quite an interesting scene if you think about it. So, and here's a line from a book. Find a nice self-sufficient hilltop and fortify it. It's from John Wyndham's The Kraken Wakes, one of my favorite books of all times. It's my go-to book whenever I need a, 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 something to read. It also, this line has made the first scene in the books, I'm, uh, the book I'm, in one of the books I'm planning from this particular idea. And of course, a whole bunch of lovely pictures. All these sea cities, floating cities, aren't they wonderful? 
this is something that feeds into the, the story that I'm feeding. The bottom right is um, a bubble of air in which they're growing land plants under the water. So there we go. So there we go. This all feeds into the notebook. And currently, I'm at this stage here. I'm gradually feeding through and thinking about everything and it's gradually feeding in. Seeking Refuge is the one where it's is the book that um, I've got um, the uh, John Wyndham quote. There's the first is the first scene in the jo in that book. It comes about John Wyndham. But you can see I have not got the end lines in either of them. So I haven't started writing. And that's my writing process pretty much. <laughs> That was brilliant! Wow, you've got a slideshow! <laughs> Pork, <laughs> what have you got for us? I'm going to have to start with a song, aren't I? <laughs> I've got to say, The Crack and Wakes and The Chrysalids are two of my favourite books ever. I've read so much John Wyndham as a kid. In fact, I found The Crack and Wakes in my shed fairly recently. I don't know how it got out there, but it's now back on my bookcase. Anyway, um, my process. Um, I kind of my process is sort of still evolving in a lot of ways because working in one series I've not really had a chance to break out although I've worked in a couple of shorts and things like that the things I've learned along the way have kind of helped a little bit so um, when I started writing Ark of Souls it was one of those moments where I'd kind of been writing probably since my teens in sort of like isolated kind of ways um, but pre-internet pre anything not even knowing anyone else that wrote you kind of run out of steam you run out of ideas um it, it, you just you saw no future and, and of course you get to the end of it you think well what am i actually going to do with it um it was only kind of in about 2010 or so i i read a book that was one of those oh, I can do better than that books um I, I, I wanted to read it i loved it i thought this is gonna be great but it kind of bugged me for about three or four years after that then when i upgraded my computer i was kind of bored one evening and i started just trying to write stuff and just typed a scene which kind of became the basis for what became Ark of Souls. Um, the process for Ark of Souls was very disorganized because it was a case of knowing that I wanted to write something but not necessarily knowing how to do it. So I kind of wrote, wrote as I went along and most of what came out got junked. It was true pantsing. I didn't know where I was going, what I was doing, but I knew it had to have structure. I knew it had to have a beginning, a middle and an end. I knew the characters had to develop and change. Um, I knew I had questions I had to answer. My original goal was just to write something that was kind of fluff in a way, kind of bubble gum. Just, just open up, read from page one to page 300 and whatever. And it's not dealt with any big issues. It's not changed your life. It's just escapism at it, its best so that was my aim but as i started to write i started to get a little bit deep and a little bit darker in some areas and i started finding it was making me ask questions so after i'd kind of rewritten that one um and i think about three of the original chapters are all what made it into the the final version um and so, so it was a, a lot of rewriting and probably took me three years to get that far um second book up ghost of the veil was a lot easier because i had a starting point and I knew where I was going with the series at that point. I'd kind of got a good idea of where the end of the series was and what was going to happen. I also had characters who had um, developed. So a, a bit like Vanessa was saying, um, I had characters that had a starting point and I knew a lot about them up to that starting point, but I needed to see how they were going to develop over interaction with each other and interaction with the story. You know, once you let the monsters loose, how they then react to the monsters so uh, i think that was that was a, a big starting point also again at that point i joined a couple of writers groups probably this one most influential influ importantly um and um that meant that i kind of realized actually fumbling in the dark is not the way forward so i actually progressed quite well and with, with that i was writing each chapter with a plan for each chapter so I'm in point A, I've got to get to point B. I'm not quite sure where point B is, but I know I've got to get there. So the chapters kind of structured themselves and then the, stru the chapters structured towards an end goal. That book did get a little bit into development hell in the middle. So around about sort of the, the, the middle third, got a bit confused. and I kind of fell back into my old habits. Um, 
But after I realized that it became very easy to fix because then I started making more notes, coming up with plans, more ideas, and that then joined to the end third, which, which worked quite well. Book three, again, much the same position. I knew where I was. I knew where I needed to get to with that book. Um, I pretty much had everything prepared in advance. I knew where we were going. I knew what we needed to do. And I had an idea of the aesthetic. I want to go back to that actually in a minute because I, I did make some notes, but I've run out of paper. So um, I'm winging it. I'm panstering it. Um, so um, I had an idea where that one was going. So that was literally just write and burn. It was just write a chapter, next one, next one, next one. And then come back and edit and revise and revise and revise and it didn't have too many plot revisions within it it also managed to pick up a couple of scenes that i'd actually cut from the previous book because they were better suited to this one so i've kind of got this folder of discarded stuff which which gets re reused and recycled um some of it does some of it doesn't but i say most of it gets kept just in case um i do use a notebook quite a lot um, I do a lot of voice notes as well on my phone because um, sometimes it's just easier to say it rather than write it. And that way I'm guaranteed to be able to read it again um, because my handwriting is pretty poor. Um, so I do a lot of kind of noting and notation and planning. I tend to think a lot when I'm in dead time, like I'm in the car or I'm at work. Um, I will tend to escape to my world. Um, and, and think about what would my characters do in this situation? What would they do in that situation? And it gets a bit hard because you realise you're sort of um, it walking that fine line between having imaginary friends and being insane. Um, so I kind of, I kind of, it does amuse me. And I, and I do kind of find that sometimes I will say things and I'll realise that that will be something that a character will say. Um, and I'll log it and I'll, I'll put it away. And I think, oh, that's a Xander line. I'm having that. Or that would be a Vic line. Sometimes I see stuff on TV um, or I'll, I'll read a song title and I think that is the basis of something that can, something can come from that. Um, to be fair, I think, I think Ghost of the Veil is pretty liberally littered with hailstorm lyrics, slimly disguised as other things. Um, so they're, they're, they're dotted around. There's a lot of that that goes on. But I kind of, I like to work in aesthetics with a story. I get kind of a look in my mind, an idea. So the original scene that i wrote was was mira looking at a planet or looking at mars rotating beneath her uh the night coming up and the, the glass going black um and her reflection showing back at her um and i didn't use that scene um but it, it defined that character and that's where i wanted to realize i wanted to explore that character and not the one that i was going to use so that was kind of interesting so again it's uh, this whole evolutionary approach that i kind of employ of, of not having a well, of not having a clue really um so i kind of have an aesthetic in mind and i kind of i want to place my stories far enough in the future so i don't get bogged down with c present day complications so i can make the science sufficiently woo science um to be plausible still um yet still relate it to relatable modern science and there'll be little things that i'll do so i'll chuck in um lots of the cities and lots of the stars and lots of the settlements have the names of sort of contemporary space programs and things like that so on mars they'll stay at the curiosity hotel um or the opportunity hotel um the capital of mars of, of, of the moon is is armstrong city um in uh the current work in progress there's, there's a reference to um nasa's telescopes being fitted to the um second chance which i wanted to sort of link historical space to future space just to give readers a little bit of a bridge i don't know quite why that's important i just sort of waffled that but yeah um so yeah i i kind of I, I, i'm i'm finding my way a little bit by little bit i'm and i'm i definitely think being a panster is biting me now because i think wheel of fire was a book i didn't quite know how to finish and i originally went a bit over in my word count um I kind of it, put a lot more on the end that shouldn't have been on the end and book four is a book that I don't really know how to start. So I think there's definitely something that's, that's going on between those two. So I'm working on fixing those sorts of problems. So yeah, I think a lot of what I do is problem solving, dig a hole, dig myself out of the hole. Um, and that's, that's, a, that can be frustrating, but equally you, you, once you've dug yourself out of that hole, you can fill it in and move on to the next one, which is inevitably deeper. 
so that was pretty rambly and i should have really made some notes but um yeah any questions um i'm happy to answer really that's it from me Right, might as well all unmute then. <laughs> yep, okay, so I didn't really have terribly much in there, but that was fine. <laughs> so I'll oh, yours, yours was lovely though, I like the diagrams, that really worked for me, being quite a visual person. Yes. Uh, I've just had to uh, do, be doing um, PowerPoint presentations for uh, <laughs> uh, a presentation for an international conference for something else, so you ended up with a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> no, it worked, it worked, it said everything you needed to. Yeah, so yeah, but anyway, there we go. I'm, I'm oh, is anyone going to grab one of the tips from someone else? I might have to rewatch it before I decide. <laughs> I, I'm going to steal them all. Um, it, was, it, 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 was, it was quite quite interesting because we got we got an order and chaos moment between Vanessa and myself. I mean, Vanessa bought the order, I bought the chaos, so that was uh, pretty excellent. <laughs> oh, I'm terrible. I just have to have everything laid out. I am really, really not a pantser. <laughs> I just have to have everything laid out. I um, I kind of, I'm seeing the benefits of that now. I don't think I could actually plan a whole book from start to finish, but I'm certainly trying to plan you chapters. Don't plan from start it. To you don't finish. sort of plan a book from start to finish. What you do is you sort of put in this trellis work, and uh, then you grow your vines over it. I see, like your skeleton, sort of the ideas for to, for yeah. fleshing in. You, you, yeah, because yeah. well, I'm a gardener, I talk about growing vines up my trellis work and that's how oh, I, I, I'm a serial killer that's why I talk about skeletons <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, I, I should I probably mention idea, that it's, uh, sorry I thought the idea of knowing where a chapter was going to end before starting writing it was going to be quite useful for me actually I think I might play around with that that was all I wanted to add <laughs> I think that's something I unconsciously have been doing for a small period of time is that knowing the chapter's end point, often before I know it's start point. So I think I'm here, I've got to get there. So you'll be very um, nearly there finding out what your last line is in the book before you uh, actually uh, start it, your book shortly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, well, I, I think I pretty much have. I think I've, I've, I've kind of written the final scene for the whole, se the whole series. So mm -hmm. I've got to get to that scene somehow. Yeah, you've just got to... The hard part. Yeah, that's the... Yeah. <laughs> That nah, seems so daunting now. Yeah, what a bad you idea. Is build a trellis, <laughs> yeah. build a bridge over there, and you'll find it's, it. It's a, it's a, it's a novel idea. It, it, it turns out it was all the, the work of the amusement park owner. Um. <laughs> <laughs> actually, with my uh, Starblood series, I've actually written what may or may not end up being the final scene, but I think it will be the final scene in book five, Pariah, and I've not really started book five, so. Yeah, okay. Final scene. I know that where that's going to It can uh, properly end and I won't go back to it, honest. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I'm quite interested in seeing where Pariah gets to. The trilogy, and now it's a five book series and no more. <laughs> <laughs> Maths aren't your strong point. <laughs> no. <laughs> Trying to fit four or five books into a trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> well, it works for Douglas <laughs> Adams, right? Oh, yes, it did, didn't it? Yes. That's where yeah. I got it from. I told you I've got this unconscious burglar. <laughs> <laughs>